Welcome back to our classroom in computational physics. We haven't been doing any recording now for a while. You may not have noticed, but we have. But thanks to a nice new grant from the National Science Foundation, from the Course Curriculum and Laboratory Improvement Division, uh, we're recording again, and we will continue in the course. So we'll start again in uh, a few minutes. But we'll introduce everything. Let me remind you that this is a class in computational physics, but it preceded by another class in introductory computational science. So uh, we're using this textbook here, which you may have seen before. You'll see again. Uh, and I'm one of the authors. Ruben Landau is my name. I have two other co-authors, Manuel Paez and Christian Bordiano. And so when I say we, I certainly mean all of the authors for the, for the material. In addition, when I say we, I'm not doing this recording myself. We have a director and a producer here, Sally Hare, and she's always present whenever you're seeing these slides, but working hard away. But here, oh, here she comes right now. She can say hello. Hello, and I am very excited to be a part of this project, and I will be looking forward to, uh, to the reaction that you have on whether this is a, a workable process for you. We have uh, done some proof of concept, and it has been very successful before. So uh, I will be watching you uh, every step of the way from the other side of the camera. So I'll hand it back to you okay. now. Thank you, Sally. <clears throat> so why don't we get on? Okay. So today, actually today and a few more days, we'll talk about computational Fourier analysis. So it's a very interesting subject. We'll talk about the mathematics, the computing, and we'll talk about the physics, particularly of nonlinear oscillations, where this analysis comes right in very well. And we'll have some little bit different slides than we've used in the past, but I'll clue you in on that. What else? Uh, on the bottom of some of these slides, you may see Bmax here, okay? And that's Blended Multimodal Access to Computational Physics Curriculum. That's the name of this project. So let's get on. Okay. This wonderful textbook, and this is part of the Shameless Commerce Division, okay? This wonderful textbook here actually has three units on different aspects of Fourier analysis. Uh, first unit, which we'll cover some fraction of only today, so it'll be another lecture on unit one, reviews the basis of Fourier analysis and the discrete Fourier transform, or what's normally called DFT. And, he, and thinking about it, many of you have seen Fourier analysis before, and you may think, I don't need a review. I recommend the review, not only because I'm giving it, but because there's many differences in viewpoint when you're thinking about computing with Fourier series as opposed to what a mathematician may present as a discussion of Fourier's theorem. So at least review it quickly, and if it's not something you know well, review it more slowly. There's another two units in the text, one on signal processing to reduce noise, and another on the fast Fourier transform, FFT. Uh, you may want to at some point skip reading about the FFT, sort of a technical discussion, but it is a big boon to all the cell phones, recording, television. It's how you can re do a Fourier analysis much more quickly than you can by just a simple equation. So the way all of these slides will work from now on well, at least we think it will, is that there'll always be up on the front slide here a little table of contents of all the sections covered. And if you look up above, you'll see, ah, there's also sections listed up there. And they get highlighted to tell you where you are, to tell me where I am, and they will change uh, with each new kind of lecture. So we'll talk about the problem as usual first, then we'll talk about Fourier synthesis, We'll give you an exercise to go into the computer and uh, do something useful rather than just listen. Uh, take a break, then we'll talk about Fourier transforms for non-periodic functions. So let's look at the next slide. This next slide states our problem. And the problem is how much of a frequency omega is in a nonlinear oscillation? Okay. So let's look at an example to see what that means. And in this series, and I'll just mention it once, examples tend to be in green for this new series of slides. So here we have a function, a sawtooth function, and we're asked, hmm, what frequencies are present in that sawtooth function? Well, first of all, what does that even mean? Well, of course, when, it's, it, when we say what frequencies are present, we almost always mean, as we say up here, 
if we say frequency omega we mean how much of sine omega t is present because the frequency by itself is not a function doesn't vary with time this is a function that varies in time so there could be a relation so we always mean how much sine omega t or cosine omega t fine okay uh, we notice also that this sawtooth function is not at all linear in the sense it's not a sine wave it's periodic it has a period what does the period mean well the period here is the repeat time and we say well okay so here the function starts at zero goes through zero here again but not the same way it started so that's not a period aha here it's going through zero again on the rise so this distance here in time is what we mean by a period okay? and then it just repeats again ad infinitum so it always repeats so we ask what frequencies are present that's what it means you can also ask the question well what's the meaning of a Fourier spectrum well that's how we answer the question what frequencies are present we answer that by saying well there's a number of frequencies present this is the right answer here we have a Fourier spectrum okay, well, which is the Fourier transform as well so we say there's mainly one frequency present here oh then there's another there's another so the answer to the question is there's an infinite number of frequencies present okay that's one answer but then you can say analytically we can be much more precise than that there's a various number of frequencies but they have different proportions and that's what we need to answer the question okay so that's the meaning of a Fourier transform it's the meaning of what frequencies are present so we say it's a periodic function it's good to keep in mind just because it has a period doesn't mean there's just one sinusoidal involved here there's many sines and cosines possibly involved and they always have different frequencies but only one period for the function each sine and cosine has its own individual period which could be different okay so finally let's say when we're talking about Fourier analysis we we tend to forget about the initial transients so it could be that you know our function here maybe started off doing wiggly things and then stabilized into what we have here so we just forget about this part here we just want the part that's really periodic okay so those are the transients so let's get on how do we answer this problem well we'll look at an example actually we'll look again we look at an example which we saw when we studied ODEs or ordinary differential equations we'll look at two examples for non-harmonic non oscillators and we'll probably leave it up to your instructor as to which one he or she wants you to focus on more than the other if not you, d you personally decide which one you're most interested in okay? the first one will be a non-harmonic oscillator so we have here a potential V of X X being position proportional to the position X to some power P and we'll use the absolute value here so there's no question about the signs okay? and if P is equal to 2 this is your old friend the harmonic oscillator and if P is not equal to 2 it's also an oscillator because no matter what happens if you put say think of a ball uh, rolling around or a, a cherry in a punch bowl moving back and forth it's always going to go back and forth on the same path here here when P equals, equals 2 it's a harmonic oscillator here P equals 6 it's almost like a square well still going to go back and forth always the same place have one period now if, as you change the amplitude here uh, the, the period may change for the harmonic oscillator it doesn't but for any other potential it will so square well in fact is very similar to what we've seen as our sawtooth function on the previous slide the other example we'll talk about is the perturbed oscillator so here we have potential which is a harmonic oscillator one half kx squared our old friend but then we have a correction term so one is no correction t minus two-thirds alpha x just numbers are put in so it looks good at some point so if x is small which is always the assumption for harmonic oscillators then e then one is big this is a small term it's just a correction so what happens of course for this non-harmonic oscillator is that if you have small oscillations here they look very much like a harmonic oscillator but then as the oscillations get bigger they stop looking like a harmonic oscillator and you notice that immediately because here on the left there's a small oscillation and on the right there's a much bigger oscillation so it's not even symmetric anymore and of course if the oscillation amplitude gets too large the ball will just roll out of the punch bowl go away to infinity okay so 
all of these cases, what's important is all these potentials which confine any object will give you a periodic function, which means it just repeats again and again in time, always the same. But periodic is not necessarily the same as sinusoidal. Only for this one special case of one half kx squared do we get a harmonic oscillator. Okay, so let's look at the next slide. Take a look at this slide. The next slide deals with Fourier theorem. Now, Fourier's theorem is something you've all seen in your math class. Possibly your math professor has spent a lot of time proving Fourier's theorem, and we won't do that here. Not just because I might not be able to, but our focus is different, and we want it's an important theorem. We need to talk about what it means. And what Fourier theorem means to us is that we can represent any single valued function, which is periodic, with a Fourier series. What does single valued mean? Well, if we have a function, you know, like this, that's single valued. That's fine. If we have another oscillation that looks something like this, like C waves repeating, yeah, that's fun. Okay. And I'm sorry. If we have something like that, that's not a single valued function because at any one time here, if we look down, we say, oh, there's one value of the function, another third value. That's not something we can reproduce with Fourier series. So these multi-valued functions, while they occur in nature, they can occur in places, they need a more sophisticated analysis, and I'm happy not to do it. So Fourier theorem says that if you have a per periodic single-valued function with only a finite number of discontinuities, so for our sawtooth function, for example, which looked like this, you can say, oh, it had infinite discontinuities if you go out to infinity, well, okay, don't be so picky. In, in any one period here, it just has one discontinuity. Okay, So that's a discontinuity where the function jumps. So it, it works for us. Okay? So any function of that sort can be represented as this infinite series. And the series involves sines, cosines, and possibly a constant term. The sine function would represent has an amplitude b sub n in front of it. The cosine function has an amplitude a sub n. So these amplitudes represent the answer to the problem. They are, in some sense, the amount of cosine omega t or the amount of sine omega t in the solution. Okay, So that's one answer to our question. That's what we mean by how much of any one frequency is present. Another way of answering that, and in practice one that's probably used more often in engineering and physics, is you don't care about the individual amplitudes, in part because there's two of them, and in part because they could be positive or negative. You care about how much power or how much intensity there is at any one frequency. So the intensity, which as a function of omega or the power, is always proportional to the sum of the squares of these amplitudes. And if the amplitudes are complex, then you just take the absolute value squared. So that's what we mean by that. Notice, it's worth emphasizing, so this is an emphasis, it's in red too, okay? Notice that when we talk about this series, it's some power n of some fundamental frequency, omega. What is omega? Well, in order for the theorem to work, even if it's a non-linear uh, function, if it's not just a sine or cosine function, we have to have omega as the true frequency of the system being 2 pi divided by the period. So you always have to know the actual period of the system. If you don't know the period, then the series is not going to work properly. Okay? So it's not the harmonic oscillator frequency, omega 1, unless you're just analyzing a linear system. Uh, in general, it has to be the true frequency. Okay? And finally, I should say that the frequency f for realistic cases may vary with amplitude. The harmonic oscillator is the exception, whether it goes small amplitude or large amplitude, they all have the same frequency. Yeah, that's why grandmother, grandfather clocks tend to have one frequency because they're very big and it's almost always a small oscillation at the bottom. The bigger you make them, the easier it is to have a small oscillation. But if you have that perturbed harmonic oscillator like we saw previously, then the frequency will change with the amplitude. And typically you get less restoring force as the amplitude gets bigger, the clocks slow down. And in fact, grandfather clocks slow down when the amplitudes get too big. So let's get on. What about a Fourier series? Here's our Fourier series here. How does it represent a function? Well, it doesn't represent a function in an exact mathematical sense. 
uh, that you may like that a power series represents a function. It what it does is it minimizes the deviation of that function from the measured values or the values uh, measured the, or the and the values represented by the function here. So these would be the measured values. These would be the values represented by the series. It dev it, it minimizes the deviation squared over all possible values represented. So it's sort of a best fit, but it's really just a best fit on the average. Okay. So you know you have an infinite number of terms and it represents on the average a good fit. Well the best you can do with this kind of a series, but it may not be precise. It may not go through all the points. It will miss the corners, particularly if it's a discontinuity. And in order to work, you need an infinite number of terms. Okay, so power series also need an infinite number of terms, but then they we, we produce a function exactly here. It's not an exact representation. Worse than that, particularly since this is a class in computational physics, is that it's not a good numerical representation of the function in general. It only becomes good if you use an infinite number of terms, which is more than we can ever do on the computer. And it only becomes good if the function doesn't have discontinuities. But if you're dealing with functions with discontinuities, it may not work well right there, and there's better ways to do it. So uh, finally, we should say, contrary to what many of us learned to think, if you have a Fourier series representation of a solution, it's not truly an analytic function. It's really an expansion of that function in some average way. So uh, you can think of it as analytic, but it's not quite. You may as well, in many cases, as we'll see, next term, uh, solve the problem computationally. So let's look at the next slide, which talks about Fourier integrals and transforms. Well, if you have a non-periodic function, such as this wave packet here, then it's kind of hard to say what the period is. <sighs> I mean, here's our function. What's the period? Well, when I give you a, a function, a graph like this, presumably it means that if it's zero here, it continues out to infinity, zero on both sides. So for all we know, the function may repeat, but it may repeat all the way out here at t equals infinity. So we could say, OK, we have to take the limit now of our Fourier series to look at functions which have periods that approach infinity, which means they don't repeat. Okay? If you have a function that doesn't repeat, that has to go, you have to wait infinite time, and look at the frequencies present, the frequencies scale like 1 over the period, which is what we had on the last slide. So the frequency is actually now very continuously, not just in those steps like we saw previously, but they'll vary smoothly. So mathematically that means what we had a sum in a Fourier series. When you're dealing with functions that are non-periodic, we actually have to use a Fourier integral. That's all there is to it. Worse than that, it doesn't matter. Because when you're dealing on the computer, the way we represent integrals, if you remember from last term, is always by representing the integral as a finite sum. So then suddenly on the computer, the Fourier series, Fourier integrals, they're much the same. Because you have to represent anything, everything by a sum. So <clears throat> let's get on with the work. Before we can get on with the work, we have to go through again uh, Landau's first rule of education. Do you remember Landau's first rule of education? I must have mentioned it a hundred times last term. Most of education is just learning what the words mean. The concepts tend to be quite easy, but you have to learn what the words mean so you know what the people up front are talking about. Okay. So here, when we talk about Fourier analysis, we almost always talk about frequencies. Omega 1 or omega 0, some people may call it. We mean the fundamental frequencies, frequency, and that's just 2 pi over the period period has to be the exact repeat time. Anything of a higher frequency might be called a harmonic. Now technically we just mean n times omega 1 are the harmonics of the system and as long as the frequency present is greater than the lowest one it might be called an overtone. Sometimes the first overtone might be the third harmonic. It just depends on the integer value. But we don't have, we're not going to talk about musical instruments. We don't have to worry about that. B0, the lowest term in the series here, the constant term, is obviously the average value of this oscillatory function. If you average over all time, you're just left with something that doesn't depend on time. 
so you get B0. And that's called the DC component because it doesn't, uh, it's direct current, it doesn't oscillate. Another popular way of looking at Fourier series, particularly from a mechanics class, when you deal with nonlinear, when you deal with a linear system, pardon me, is to say, oh, Fourier series represents a sum over normal modes. Well, that's not true in general. That's true only for linear systems where each term in the series would be a possible solution and they'd be called a normal mode. Here we have an infinite number of terms, but it may not be that kind of a mode. <clears throat> so let's look at the next slide and see how we apply these theorems to some useful examples. Well, as we see on this slide, we're asking the question, how do you apply a Fourier series for nonlinear oscillation? Well, the first question is, can you do it at all? Well, Fourier theorem says yes. It doesn't say it has to be a linear oscillation. It just says it has to be a periodic function. And so if you're oscillating in a well of any shape, as long as you're bound, confined, it's going to be periodic. It's going to be back and forth. So the Fourier series here is fine for a nonlinear oscillation may not be a very good tool, but it's at least kosher. Okay? So what, what, if we have nonlinear oscillations, however, things do change. The first thing to remember is it's not a harmonic oscillator. Harmonic oscillator is unique in that for all amplitudes, the period is the same. When you have a nonlinear oscillation, the period, if you want the fundamental, the lowest frequency you get, depends on the amplitude. So large oscillations tend to go more slowly. You know this from grandfather and grandmother clocks that uh, they have to be corrected if the oscillations get too large. The reason they get accurate when they're so big is then the oscillations can be very small and keeps them all the same period. So that's a nonlinear oscillation. Okay. Secondly, the big difference is when you have a nonlinear oscillation, the individual terms, the cosine omega t, the sine omega t in a Fourier series no longer are solutions to the problem. The sum, the infinite sum of all terms are, but not the individual terms. And that of course follows from the principle of non the principle of linear superposition being applied to a nonlinear system. Okay? Doesn't work here. The principle of linear superposition says if you have a linear system, one in which the restoring force or torque is proportional to the displacement, then if you have two solutions, y1, y2, then some linear combination of the two must also be a solution. That just doesn't hold for nonlinear systems. Consequently, even though the sum is a solution, that doesn't mean the individual terms are. Okay. Finally, we should say if you have a truly highly nonlinear system, as you may get in a chaotic system, then a Fourier series is not the best tool. It's a useful tool uh, because you'll see that there's broadband spectrum, broadband Fourier spectrum, all many, many uh, amplitudes come in, many frequencies if the system's chaotic, and you'll find that there are many overtones. So it's at least a clue, but if there's many overtones, you can't say one or two things are happening. Okay, so let's move on. How do you actually determine the coefficients, the Fourier coefficients? That's this next slide. Well, I know many of you will say the way you determine Fourier coefficients is you look up the equation in the textbook and you just apply it, use it. Well, that's one way. It's actually very easy to derive that equation. You know, you may have to do that sometime when you're stranded on a desert island and your textbooks are back home. So if you think of the function y of t that we've been dealing with here as a ray in a Hilbert space using a Dirac notation here in physics, so this is the function and what we need to do is then project out uh, with a definite frequency state into the function or a signal and that will give us the individual coefficients. So if we perform that integration, so here is the cosine omega t, so that's the omega term, and, and in here is our y of t term, you know, it's y of t, okay, and now it's just the inner product of the two and we do the projection. So if we do that, what we get is the simple expression, a of n, b of n, is either the integral of cosine or sine 
times the function. And then for any practical case, you just evaluate that. So uh, <clears throat> one thing we notice immediately is since we're just integrating over a period from 0 to t of the function, that if the, fu uh, the, the zeroth coefficient in here, the 0 for the cosine, is just 2 times the average value of the function. So if the function oscillates around 0, then there can't be any a0 term, because the average is 0. If it doesn't, then we get an a0 term the DC component. Okay. Second thing we notice is that you should be smart. You can do a lot of work or you can do less work just by having a better algorithm. And in this case, a better algorithm means take advantage of the symmetry of the function. So if we have a odd function, here one in which y of t and is equal to minus y of minus t, then half of the coefficients, all the a sub n's, must vanish. Because all the cosine terms are even, therefore they can't exist. So we can get rid of half the work. Likewise, if we have a uh, even function, y of minus t is equal to y of t, then all the sine terms, all the b terms, must vanish. So we can get rid of those. Okay. That being said, we have to be careful. Realistic calculations don't always preserve the symmetry. We don't integrate often over zero to infinity. In this case, even a full period, we can do that, but we have to approximate the integration. So uh, it's not exact any longer. And so there may be, even for uh, an even case, there may be some small values of b sub n. That's not bad. That at least tells you, gives you a handle on what the approximations in the theory might be, what the approximations in your application might be. Okay, so <clears throat> let's move on and look at an example. Now we'll look here at a very simple example, our friend the sawtooth function, and it's good to have an analytic example to start with. So here we have the sawtooth function, and it's obviously periodic, it repeats, goes back, same thing, over and over again, so that's one period from top to top is a period. <clears throat> and here on the right, we actually show you the Fourier spectrum that you should get if you do this properly. Okay? And equation 7 here gives the, the, for the sawtooth function as a linear function from 0 to t over 2, so that's this line going up, and then a slightly a different displaced linear function here. Ooh, terrible. Okay, a different displaced linear function here. Better. Uh, for the second half of the period. So, we can use it here. It's uh, periodic. That's fine. It's non-harmonic, it's not just a simple sine wave. It's discontinuous, which is a challenge, but possible with a Fourier series. And it has, obviously, sharp corners. So it, it's an interesting case for you to look at on the computer. Okay, how would you, you, you do this? Well, you can work hard, you could say it really is an odd function. If we were smart enough to say, this is our origin right here, Okay, then it would be positive on one side and negative on the other, and we'd have an odd function. So we can just use a sine series. All we have to do is shift the function over to the left a little bit. But we can do that. So if we shift the function over to the left, we get a simple function, just t, just t, okay, over some constant here, the slope, and, over, and that's one interval, goes from a total time of t. So that's all we have to use. We now can apply our formula. We get only b coefficients. And what are they? Well, we get the series here on equation 10. And what you see, forgetting about the overall magnitude, is it has a sine, amplitude 1, then a sine of 2 omega t, amplitude minus a half, and then a sine of 3 omega t, amplitude plus a third. But that's exactly what we see up here in the Fourier spectrum. We have one here, or at least that's the first coefficient. The one coefficient is positive. The two coefficient is, ooh, it's negative and it's just about half the size. The third coefficient is positive again and it's just about a third the size, etc. Et so the series goes on to infinity and it just agrees with our analytic function. Okay, so that's enough of me doing the work here. It's about time you did something. So let's look at this exercise here on the next slide.
well, we're nice to you. Okay? We, we've given you the answer. We've shown you the answer for the sawtooth function. And, of course, your instructor may decide not to be nice and make you do another problem. But we just want you to take this problem for which you know the analytic solution and check it out on the computer. Sum it up for 2, 4, 10, 20, as many terms as you want until you can see how at first you get a crude approximation which then gets better and better and better as you use more and more terms. And really what we want you to do is to discover how many terms do you need to make this really good. And then if I suspect some of you out there are saying, this guy says really good, what does he mean by really good? I don't know what I mean by really good. It depends on the circumstances, you know, situational ethics. Well, first you want it to look on the screen like it's reproducing the function. If it doesn't look good on the screen, and the screen's only showing you one or two decimal places, then it certainly is not a very good representation. But then, you know, what if you're an engineer or a scientist and you're saying, hey, uh, slide rules gave me three places of accuracy, can calculators give me eight or ten, really good should be as good as a slide rule three places or really as good as a hand calculator ten places okay how many terms do you need to get ten place precision that's a harder problem you should check that out also check two periods one period anything could happen it may work it may not and compare to the analytic signal so you have something to compare with what you should find particularly at the discontinuities is very interesting you should find that the discontinuities that should give you the right answer on the average, but it, it won't hit the discontinuities precisely. And as you, as you use more and more terms, you do a better and better job of the discontinuities, but hey, you never really get it right. Okay, so you should find that. That's a phenomenon was studied by the ma mathematician Gibbs, and he found that you always get an overshoot and you can prove that mathematically. It always goes too high on one side and then compensates by going too low on the other side. And, and he even was able to say that overshoot is about 9% of the signal strength. Okay? So, take a break. Go to the labs, you know, go home, sit on your laptop, someplace. Try this out. It's easy, it's fun, it's the way we go. And next time, we'll move on and look at some more applications of for a series and how you actually compute them on the computer. Okay, and that's a little bit different than what the analytic case might be. So that's all for now. Bye bye.